Morty's rotational Rick back talking to you about solids of revolution using the disc method. And I got another question. What do you call a detective who gets electrocuted? Sherlock Holmes! Ah, what we love dumb dumb! First thing we're talking about is a solid of revolution. That would be a solid created when a region in the plane is revolved about a line. So here you can see we have this two-dimensional region in our plane, and it is connected to this line. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to take that two-dimensional region, and we're going to revolve it about this line to create this solid of revolution over here, this three-dimensional figure. Now, the axis of revolution is the line which a region in the plane is revolved about to create a solid of revolution. So we just said we're going to take a region in the plane and we're going to revolve it about a line to create this solid of revolution over here. Now, that line that it's revolving about, we call the axis of revolution. Now let's talk about a disc. That would be a solid created by revolving a rectangle about an axis of revolution adjacent to one side of the rectangle. So to create a disc, what's going to happen is you're going to have a rectangle. And that rectangle is going to be adjacent on one side to your axis of revolution. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that rectangle and we're going to swing it around or about that axis of revolution. Thereby creating this disc right here. Notice that the width of our rectangle we label it W and the height we actually label with this capital R. And that's because when we revolve this rectangle about our axis of revolution, we create this disc, which then has a radius that is equal to the height of our rectangle here. Next, we're going to quickly review finding volume using cross sections. So this says to find the volume of a solid with a known cross section, like a square, triangle, etc., take the definite integral of the area of the given cross section over the specified interval. So let's say we have a three-dimensional figure like this, and we want to find the volume of this figure. What we're going to do is we're going to integrate from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to whatever x value this is. The area formula for one of these cross sections, which in this case would be a a rectangle. If I were to integrate the area formula for a rectangle on this given interval from this x value, x is equal to zero, to this x value, whatever that may be, it will give me the exact volume of this three-dimensional solid that has rectangular cross sections. Now note, this is very similar to the way we find the exact area under the curve. When we integrate to find the area under the curve, we're technically adding up the areas of an infinite amount of rectangles. Here, we're technically adding together the volumes of an infinite amount of rectangles prisms with width of dx or delta x. So again, all you need to note is that in order to find the volume of a three-dimensional figure with known cross sections, you know what shape the cross section is. You can just integrate the area formula for that cross section on your specified interval. That will give you the volume. Now let's talk about finding the volume of a three-dimensional solid using the disk method. So to find the volume of a solid with the disk method, you must use the given integrals, where pi r squared represents the area of each cross-section, which is a circle, and dx represents the width of each cross-section. So just like finding the volume of your three-dimensional solid with known cross-sections, all you have to do to find the volume of our three-dimensional solid here is integrate the area formula for its given cross-section. And because we're revolving a region about a line, the cross-sections of this three-dimensional solid are going to be circles. So we are integrating the area formula for a circle, pi r squared. Now, in this case, because pi is just a constant, we can move that out front of the integral sign. So we're really just integrating r squared, where r is the radius of that cross section. And the radius of your circular cross section is just the distance from your axis of revolution to your actual function. So what we're actually doing with this integral is we are adding together the volumes of an infinite amount of disks in order to get the exact exact volume of this three-dimensional solid. And these disks have a radius of r, which we just talked about, and a width of delta x, or dx. Now, something I want you to note would be that these figures down here all deal with a horizontal axis of revolution. But you can have a vertical axis of revolution. And when that happens, instead of integrating with respect to x, you're going to be integrating with respect to y. So please pay attention to whether your axis of revolution is a horizontal line or a vertical vertical line. That will then affect what you're integrating with respect to x or y. Want to hear a joke about potassium? Okay. <laughs> it's example time.
Now, example one says find the volume of the solid form by revolving the region bounded by the graph of the function f of x is equal to the square root of sine x and the x axis on the interval from zero to pi about the x axis. So again, what's happening here is we are taking this region bounded by the function f of x is equal to the square root of sine x and the x axis, revolving it about the x axis to get this solid of revolution, meaning it's creating a three dimensional solid with circular cross sections because our region is attached or connected to our axis of revolution i'm going to have to use the disk method so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate the area formula for the given cross section here which in this case would be a circle so we're going to integrate pi r squared now let's take a look at how we set up that definite integral so the first thing you need to do in setting up a definite integral is determine what interval you are integrating on well if you didn't see in the question that it gives you the interval from zero to pi what you could do is just determine where the function f of x intersects your axis of revolution so where does the square root of sine of x equals zero if you look at this particular graph you can see that at x is equal to zero and x is equal to pi the square root of sine of x is equal to zero so that is the interval that we are going to integrate on next we need to think because we're finding volume we're obviously integrating an area formula so what area formula are we integrating here well because we're revolving this solid about the x-axis and it's connected to that axis of revolution we're going to be using the disk method in order to find this volume, meaning we're going to integrate the area of a circle formula, pi r squared. The only thing we need to find is our radius. What is r in this case on that given interval? In order to find the radius here, it's just going to be the distance from our function to our axis of revolution. What is that distance here? Well, in order to find this distance, you need to take whatever's greater in terms of y and subtract whatever's lesser in terms of y. So our function is clearly above our axis of revolution. So we're going to take our function, which is f of x is equal to the square root of sine of x, and subtract our axis of revolution, which is just y is equal to zero, the x-axis, square root of sine of x minus zero is just going to be the square root of sine of x. That is going to be the radius of your given circular cross sections here. So now that I know my interval and I know what my radius is, I can set up my integral from a to b of the area formula for my given cross section, which is pi r squared. And remember the pi just jumps out front because it's a constant. So all I have to do is plug in zero for my a, plug in pi for my b, and my radius I found to be the square root of sine of x. So that's going to go in here. Sweet. Now I'm ready to evaluate this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So first thing we need to do here is simplify inside the brackets, the square root and the square. Oh, those cancel each other out. That's nice. So now all I have to do is just integrate sine x and use the fundamental theorem of calculus with these given limits of integration. So what is the antiderivative of sine of x? That would be negative cosine of x. I then evaluate this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. I take my upper limit of integration, pi, plug that in for x and subtract. When I plug in my lower limit of integration, zero for x, I then simplify each of these cosine of pi is going to be negative negative one cosine of zero is going to be one. I then simplify inside the brackets and I get pi times the quantity one plus one, which equals two pi. Now that is going to be the volume of the solid created by revolving that region between this function and the x axis on the given interval from zero to pi about the x axis. Now example two says find the volume of the solid form by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of f of x is equal to two minus x squared and g of x is equal to one about the line y is equal to one. So again, I am finding the volume of a solid that is formed by revolving this region this time about an axis of revolution, meaning it's creating a three dimensional solid with circular cross sections because our region is attached or connected to our axis of revolution. I'm going to have to use the disk method. Now, in order to use the disk method, what I need to do is set up an integral from a to b of the area formula for my given cross section which in this case would be circles so it's going to be the integral from a to b of pi r squared dx so now all we have to do is fill out that definite integral so in order to fill out the definite integral the first thing we need to find is the interval on which we're integrating on well if you noticed on that previous slide we're integrating from negative one to one but let's say you didn't know that let's say you didn't see our given graph you just need to figure out where does your function intersect the axis of revolution, which is y is equal to one in this case. So all you have to do to figure that out is set those two functions equal to one another, and you can figure out where they intersect. So if I set two minus x squared equal to one and solve for x, I can just subtract two from both sides, add x squared to both sides. I get x squared minus one is equal to zero. Now, why did I do it like this? Because I now have a difference of squares is equal to zero. So I can factor this into the quantity x plus one times the quantity x minus one. And using the zero product property, 
I know that since this times this equals zero, either this is equal to zero or this is equal to zero. So I set each of those things equal to zero and I solve for x. Over here I get x is equal to negative one. Over here I get x is equal to positive one because that's where our function intersects our axis of revolution. And we are revolving that region between our function and the axis of revolution about that axis. We are integrating on the interval from negative one to one. Now that we have our interval, the next step would be to determine what area formula are we integrating? Well, because we're revolving this about an axis, the cross sections here are going to be circles, meaning to get the volume of that solid that is created by revolving this region about our axis of revolution, we need to integrate the area formula for a circle, which is pi r squared. So we just need to figure out what is our radius? What is our r on this given interval? Well, if you recall, because our region is attached or connected to our axis of revolution we are using disk method meaning our radius is just going to be the distance between our function and the axis of revolution so to find that distance here you need to take whatever's greater in terms of y and subtract whatever's lesser in terms of y so our function is clearly above our axis of revolution so to find this radius here the distance between our function and our axis of revolution you're going to take the function and subtract the axis of revolution so it's going to be 2 minus x squared minus whatever our axis of revolution is which in this case is one that will give you the radius of our circular cross sections so if i subtract these two values i end up getting one minus x squared that is going to be the radius of our given circular cross sections when we revolve this region about the line y is equal to one so now that i have my radius and i have my interval i can set up my definite integral from a to b of pi r squared now remember that pi is just a constant so it moves out front of the integral sign now i plug in negative one for my a one for my b i plug in my radius which i found to be 1 minus x squared for r of x. I now have my definite integral that I can evaluate using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So all I have to do then is simplify inside the brackets first. The quantity 1 minus x squared squared is the same thing as 1 minus x squared times 1 minus x squared. So I need to FOIL that out. And when I do and simplify, I end up getting 1 minus 2x squared plus x to the fourth. Now I'm ready to integrate. So I'm going to take the antiderivative of each term separately in here. I then use the fundamental theorem of calculus by plugging in my upper limit of integration, 1 one for each of the x's and subtracting when I plug in my lower limit of integration, negative one for each of the x's. I then simplify and I end up getting, when I multiply pi on at the end, that the volume of the solid created by revolving that region between our function and the axis of revolution about that axis of revolution, y is equal to one, is equal to 16 pi over 15. Now example three says find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of f of x is equal to 2x squared, g of x is equal to zero, and x is equal to two about the line x is equal to two. So we again are finding the volume of a solid created by revolving a particular region about a line, an axis of revolution, meaning it's creating a three-dimensional solid with circular cross sections. Because our region is attached or connected to our axis of revolution, I'm going to have to use the disk method. Now, in order to use the disk method, what I need to do is set up an integral from A to B of the area formula for my given cross section, which in this case would be circles. So it's going to be the integral from A to B of pi r squared. But in this case, our axis of revolution is a vertical line, whereas before it was a horizontal line. And when that happens, instead of integrating with respect to x, you're going to be integrating with respect to y. So let's take a look at how we set up that integral. Remember, the first step in setting up a definite integral to find the volume of a solid of revolution or a solid with known cross sections, you need to find the interval that you're integrating on. However, in this case, we are given our function in terms of x, whereas we just said we're going to integrate with respect to y because our axis of revolution is a vertical line. So the first thing we should do here is rewrite our given function here in terms of y. So we're going to take f of x is equal to 2x squared. We're just going to rewrite that as y is equal to 2x squared. And we're going to solve this for x. So when we do, we divide both sides by 2 square root both sides. You get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of y over 2. Now, if you saw before on our graph, we're just taking the positive version of the square root of y over 2. So we're going to rewrite this as our new function f of y. Now, again, all we did was just solve this equation right here this function here for x to get it in terms of y that will then help us when we try to integrate with respect to y so now we have our function in terms of y we can now go and find our interval like we wanted to remember on our graph the interval is just going to be the points where our function intersects
vertex our axis of revolution. But in this case, because we have a vertical line that is our axis of revolution, we're no longer looking for the x values at which the function intersects our axis of revolution. We're looking for the y values. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our function f of y and we're going to set that equal to our axis of revolution, which in this case is x is equal to 2. So we set each of those things equal to one another and we can solve for where they intersect. So how do I solve for y? Well, I square both sides, multiply both sides by 2, I get y is equal to 8. So I know that at y is equal to 8, the function is going to intersect our axis of revolution. But what about the other part of our interval? We know our b value. What about our a value? Where does it start? Well, in the question itself, it says your region is bounded by the line g of x is equal to 0 or y is equal to 0. Because of that, we know we are integrating from y is equal to 0 to y is equal to 8. The next step is to determine what are we integrating. We know we're integrating from 0 to 8, but what is the area formula of our given cross section? Well, because we're taking this region and revolving it about the vertical line x is equal to 2, we're going to have circular cross sections, meaning we're going to integrate the area formula for a circle, pi r squared. So all we have to do then is just figure out what is our radius? What is going to be our r in this case? Well, like we said before, the radius of your given circular cross section is just going to be the distance between your function and your axis of revolution. Now, in the previous examples, when we tried to figure out the radius, our function was always greater than our given axis of revolution. It was always above our axis of revolution on the graph. This time, because we're integrating with respect to y, we're going to look at whichever is greater in terms of x. That is going to be subtracted from whatever is lesser. So does our function or our axis of revolution have greater x values? So you're just looking for whether your function or your axis of revolution is further right on the x axis. In this case, our axis of revolution is further to the right than our function. Meaning, in order to figure out the radius here of our given circular cross section, it's going to be our axis of revolution, which is 2, minus our function, which we said was the square root of y over 2. That will then give us the radius here of our circular cross sections. Now that I know my interval and I know my radius, I can set up my definite integral, and it's going to be the integral from a to b of pi r squared. Now again, pi is just a constant, so that can hop out front of our integral sign. Now we plug in what we know. We know our a value is 0. That goes in here. Our b value is 8. That goes in there. Our radius we found to be 2 minus the square root of y over 2, so we can plug that in there. Now we're ready to roll. So how do we integrate this? Well, we need to simplify what's in here first. So that's actually kind of a tedious process. Let's show you how that works. To simplify this, what we're going to do is we're going to FOIL this out because this is technically 2 minus rad y over 2 times 2 minus rad y over 2. So if we FOIL that out, we end up getting something that looks like this. Now I want to rationalize this radical right here. So what I'm going to do is multiply the numerator and denominator by rad 2, and I end up getting something that looks like this. Now the 4 and the 2 simplify to give us 2 rad 2y. Now, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to integrate each term separately. The reason is because one of these is going to require u substitution. So here, this 4 is going to hop out front of our integral because that's just a constant. Same thing with the 2 and same thing with a 1 half here because this is technically 1 half times y. So I can take a 1 half and just move that out front of the integral sign. Now, in order to integrate this, in order to find the antiderivative of the square root of 2y dy, this is going to require u substitution. I'm going to set u equal to 2y. The reason is because when I take the derivative here, the derivative derivative of u with respect to y is going to be du dy. The derivative of 2y is just going to be 2. Multiply both sides by dy, I get du is equal to 2 dy. And notice, we do have a 2 and a dy in the problem. So I can substitute u in for this 2y, and I can substitute du in for the 2 dy. Now we're ready to integrate here. So when I take the antiderivative of dy, that's just going to be y. When I take the antiderivative of u to the 1 half power, because that's what the square root of u is, it's going to be u to the 1 half plus 1 over 1 half plus 1. And when I take the antiderivative of y dy, that's just going to be y squared over 2. I then multiply back on the constants that were out front of each of those integrals, and now I simplify inside of my brackets. Once I do that, I end up getting 4y minus 2 over 3, u to the 3 halves, plus y squared over 4. Now, in order to evaluate this using the fundamental theorem of calculus by plugging in our lower and upper limits of integration, I need them all to be in terms of y. So I'm going to take whatever I set u equal to, which was 2y, plug that back in for u, and now I'm ready to roll. So I'm going to evaluate this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm going to take my upper limit of integration, 8, and plug that in for each of the y's, and then subtract when I plug in my lower limit of integration, 0, for each of the y's. I then simplify inside each of these parentheses and multiply that pi on at the end, and I get that the volume of the solid generated by revolving the area of that region between our function and the vertical line x is equal to 2 about the line x is equal to 2 is 16 pi over 3.